I'm John Lorton, and I've been looking into mysterious occurrences since 2015. Joining me today are some friends from Uncovered.com. I'm Andre Cipriano, a forensic psychologist and the digital content specialist at Uncovered. I'm Dana Pohl. I'm a librarian, host of the True Crime PI podcast, and head of community at Uncovered. Welcome back to Lord and Arts Uncovered. And before we start today's episode, we have a few announcements. First of all, this will be our final episode, and I just want to thank Uncovered CEO Jim Brown for lending me his amazing researchers to do this series. Yeah, it's, you know, it's definitely really bittersweet to say goodbye after an incredible year of being a part of the show, uh, the support and encouragement, and of course, curiosity that you've all shown in the comment section has been a total dream come true. I'm always impressed with the new angles and theories that you all offer. And it shows that this community truly cares about finding answers. And, you know, we're not done telling victim stories. Dana and I are still going to be around in the true crime space. And of course, we're going to be active supporters of John's amazing work. And I would like to thank you, John, for giving me the opportunity to cover and discuss these cases in a collaborative format. Our individual perspectives combined with insightful comments that our, the audience has shared Give me hope that one day these families will get the answers they deserve. And as Aunt Andrea said, we aren't leaving the true crime space. It is our passion. I firmly believe that no matter how awful the truth may be, nothing could be worse than the not knowing. Keep watching, commenting, and sharing John's work because together we can and are making a difference. Well, I think you both know I've been very, very proud to do this work with you guys because I've always wanted to highlight what you're doing over at Uncovered. It is, I feel like it's an extension of us here in terms of brain scratch and kind of the deeper research look into these stories. And they're going to keep doing that. So just be sure to visit them over at uncovered.com. And of course, I've been very proud that, um, we've been able to use your materials officially because I know there's some other shows out there that have been just kind of, mm -hmm. <laughs> we're going to pull a little easy script together here and not really give someone credit. Obviously, uh, we weren't going to do that here. So I'm very proud that we were able to work this out and get through. This is going to be the 27th case that we actually reviewed together. So um, we've saved one of uncovered.com's most highly viewed cases for last. And it's a case that might be connected to some very dark family secrets. Secrets so dark that they are crimes in themselves. We're talking today about the disappearance of Brittany Wood. I had the opportunity to dive deep into this case with a small team of uncovered community members and Brittany's stepmother, Stephanie. Much of the timeline we will share today has been pieced together from information Stephanie gathered throughout the years and FOIA requests made by our research team. Last year, members of this team formed the Alabama Cold Case Advocacy Group and are continuing their fight to find Brittany. Today's case takes us to Mobile, Alabama, a city founded over 100 years before Alabama was even a state. Wikipedia says that Mobile is the county seat of Mobile County. The population within the city is around 200,000 people. It is now the second most populous city in Alabama, right after Huntsville. Mobile has four nicknames, the Azalea City, the City of Six Flags, the Port City, and the Gateway to the Gulf. At least two of those names are related to the fact that Mobile is Alabama's only saltwater port leading to the Gulf Coast. The Port of Mobile has always played a key role in the economic health of the city and is currently the 8th largest and 12th busiest port in the United States. The port is also home to the Battleship Memorial Park, which is home to the USS Alabama. 
Mobile is also known for celebrating New Year's Eve in an interesting way. Since 2008, the city of Mobile has been lowering a 12-foot tall lighted moon pie sign to celebrate the coming of the new year. A moon pie is a graham cookie with a marshmallow stuffing in it. It's a snack cake popularized in the South. The giant moon pie descends a 34-story building at the stroke of midnight, and then the world's largest edible moon pie is cut and served to the public as part of those festivities. It weighs 55 pounds and can absolutely shatter your diet plans with its over 40,000 calories. Now, a young woman named Brittany Wood would only get a few years to experience those unique festivities before she went missing in May of 2012. And while we frequently talk about stories that remind us to be careful of people that we don't know very well, today's story reminds us that threats can also be a lot closer to home than we expect. Andrea, Dana, how does this timeline come together and what can you tell us about Brittany? May 30th, 2012 was a typical hot and humid Alabama evening when 19-year-old Brittany Nicole Wood left her mother's house on Leonardo Drive in Tillman's Corner. She told her mother, Chessie Wood, that she was going to see a friend. Chessie vividly recalls standing on the front porch of her house between 7 and 7.30 p.m. when Brittany came out of the front door with a pink or teal tote, walked across the yard, and continued down the street until Chessie could no longer see her. She didn't realize that very well could be the last time that she would ever see her daughter alive. Brittany was also tackling motherhood herself, becoming a young mom just two years before at the youthful age of 17. Unfortunately, Brittany has neither been seen nor heard from since walking away from her mother's house that evening, and the details around her disappearance are painting a very grim picture. Brittany endured what no child should ever be forced to experience. At an early age, she was molested by her maternal grandmother's boyfriend, who, as a result, was sentenced to life in prison. Sadly, the mistreatment of this young girl did not stop there. Eventually, a full-blown child sex trafficking ring within her own family would be uncovered in a subsequent investigation. A total of 11 Wood family members and close friends of the family wound up facing sex abuse allegations. Unfortunately, a common outcome for victims of abuse is struggling with substance use disorder. And according to the Mobile County Assistant District Attorney, Nikki Patterson, Brittany did not escape that fate either. I know that family dynamics can be very hard to understand, but I don't think I've ever heard of anything like this. An entire trafficking ring in her family like that's insane i know and you know to your point it's almost entirely unheard of and so regardless of economic status you know family situations can either be safe secure havens or a dark toxic hell where it feels like the only safe option is to escape so you know for most families their experience is something in between Brittany grew up in a large family with lots of relatives and family friends as a teen, she was considered somewhat of a free spirit, bouncing from one relative's home to the to another. When asked about her upbringing, Chessie now says that in hindsight, she would have been safer in a crack house than in the environment in which she was raised. That is just so sad. And if you can't trust your own family, then who in this world can you trust? I mean, that's it's terrible. Yeah. And I mean, that sometimes feels like an impossible question. But thankfully, there were a few bright spots in Brittany's life and in her family. As Chessie's oldest daughter, Brittany and Chessie had a special relationship. Brittany also had a great relationship with her father, Wally Hankey, and stepmother, Stephanie Hankey, who often helped care for Brittany's daughter, Peyton. All three of them remained staunch advocates for her case. And Peyton, who turns 13 this year, dearly misses her mother and deserves to know what happened. Now, one sentiment that is strongly echoed online is that Brittany is a fighter and that she didn't want to see those that she loved get hurt. So how does this young mother just go missing? Do we have a solid timeline on this? Not much is known about Brittany's activities prior to her disappearance. 
In early interviews, Chessie stated Brittany was in a good mood and seemed fine when she left their home. However, Chessie later stated in a docu-series produced by Peacock titled Monster in the Shadows that Brittany seemed aggravated or frustrated when she left, telling Chessie that she wouldn't understand and, th and that she would be back later. Although Brittany indicated that she was going to visit a friend, the family would later discover that Donnie Holland, Brittany's uncle by marriage, actually picked her up at the end of Leonardo Drive. Donnie had recently run into some serious issues. So several months prior in early 2012, another uncle of Brittany's, Scott Wood, had taken a job that required him to relocate to Alabama. He initially moved in with Donnie Holland and his family, including Donnie's wife, Wendy. While living there, Scott discovered inappropriate messages on one of the family computers, and he reported this to law enforcement. Baldwin County investigator Eric Winberg was assigned to investigate a growing number of allegations against Donnie Holland. As part of his investigation, Winberg contacted Brittany, and it seemed that she was willing to speak to him about Donnie. So we have a terrible situation and now a new, very real pressure point in terms of there's an investigation into what's going on around this family. And obviously, if Donnie is part of what's happening there, it seems like he could have some fears about what Brittany is going to exactly say to these investigators, especially if he has any things that he's done to her in particular. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, yeah. yeah. And, you know, on top of that, Brittany had recently been in communication with a cousin who told her that she had been sexually assaulted, not only by Donnie Holland, but by Scott Wood and another family member named Dustin Kent. Brittany would tell that cousin, I'm sorry, I love you. And this was over Facebook Messenger. That's so weird. So Scott Wood, the person that kind of opens all this up to law enforcement, has accusations against him as well. And even if there's a situation where Donnie wasn't assaulting Brittany, we know that there is another cousin now that is reaching out to Brittany. And at least based on that comment, it seems like Brittany feels like she has some ownership in this issue for some reason. I'm sorry. I love you. Um, mm -hmm. I wonder yeah. if it's aged too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It could like be. Like protective. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, it just really makes me wonder why would Brittany even decide to meet up with Donnie, like with all this going on, law enforcement starting to, you know, look into this, like, what's the motivating factor for, I'm going to go talk to uncle Donnie. I, I don't know, but we do know that she did. So what happens from there? Brittany and Donnie traveled to a home about an hour away near Styx river in Robertsdale, where Holland was staying at the time with a friend. Brittany's phone records indicated she was communicating with friends via text messages and phone calls throughout the day and into the evening. The last phone call she answered was at 11.29 p.m. from her former boyfriend and the father of Peyton, Andy Hamilton. They spoke for about a minute, and then all communication seemed to stop. By 11.36 p.m., all incoming calls, including Andy's attempt to reach her again, go directly to voicemail. Chessie says the home in Robertsdale is the last place that Brittany is known to have been seen alive. However, there seems to be conflicting information on whether anyone, in fact, saw Brittany at that home. Investigator Winberg stated that cell phone records indicate that Wendy Holland, Donnie's wife, met up with Donnie at the Sticks River house. However, he does not clarify the exact time that she arrived there. At 12.07 a.m., Brittany's phone pings in Robertsdale, and phone records indicate that Brittany's voicemail is accessed, but there is no confirmation on whether this is done by Brittany or by someone else. Brittany's phone ping for the last time at 1.47 a.m. in Grand Bay, which was back in Mobile County, back in the direction of her house or a little past her house, actually. Cell phone records indicate that Donnie's phone also pings off a cell tower near Chessie's home, and this is in the early morning hours. But where he goes or why he returns just remains unknown. All right, let's take a look at the map and try to figure out some of this. We've talked about a lot of movements, and now we have cell phone pings. So the original address for the home is this on uh, Lenard Drive right up here. 
And from there, it seems like she's taken out to Robertsdale, this area close to Styx. This is the Styx River right out here. Um, but then for that last ping, we get this kind of overshoot and it winds up in Graham Bay. Is this, do we know that this location is actually this TA travel center? Is that accurate? This, uh, we, we used coordinates to get this ping. Do we know if that ping is literally tied into uh, this? I think, Go ahead. I think that it's the general area, okay. um, you know, to, I mean, to be specific, I don't know that, 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 that is, was possible, but yeah. it is the general area. Yeah. It's been, I mean, if it's just a cell phone ping, then you know, yeah, it's probably within, you know, a mm -hmm. couple miles of here. Um, if it was GPS information, that might be a little different, but it, it yeah. sounds like it's ping information. It's just, it's interesting to note that, okay, well, we do have, you know, it looks like a truck stop, I would bet. That is coming. Yeah. Full on mm -hmm. truck stop. That's kind of coming up on that pin, but, um, really, really weird. I'm concerned just because thinking about the possibility that Donnie did something to her out there and this path of travel, we've got them going right around the bay. Yeah. And, and one of these drives is putting them literally on bridges overlooking the water. Let me go ahead and drop down on it real quick so we can take a look. Mm. Yeah. One of those highways is actually kind of out in the middle. It's like a bit more of a suspended bridge. Mm. So depending on which one that you would take. Um, right. And, you know, before when we looked at this, we were looking at the view from one of those bridges out there. It looked like it would have been pretty hard to kind of pull over and stop. Mm -hmm. On this side, it's a little different because we've got more grass and kind of land over on this edge here. So, yeah, I'm just I'm concerned about this path of travel and knowing it's in the middle of the night, how many people are out there at this time. Yes, it's a populated mm -hmm. area. Um, but how long would it take for someone to stop on the side of the road and and roll her into the water. Um, yeah. And I wonder too, you know, if locals would know that, you know, cause there are just some places where people dump trash all the time. Right. So if, if someone is doing that late at night, it might not seem incredibly suspicious. You know, obviously it's going to depend on traffic and all of that and, you know, how dense it all is. Um, but that's definitely something to consider for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's just really troubling. It's that whole aspect of, I mean, this ties right into the ocean and, uh, you know, I think typically with the way that rivers would flow, it's going to push mm -hmm. to the south. Man, it could be really, really tough to find her if, if she was left in that bay. Especially if he's thinking, you know, he has to double back and go home anyway. Yeah. Thinking, you know, oh, I know a spot. I drive past it. Right, right. And why swing back out with her phone? I guess maybe maybe he doesn't know or, or he has it and he hasn't figured out to, you know, turn it off at that point. Something along mm -hmm. those lines could be the only reason why it pings back out over in that other side. But I think that definitely goes into the some of the theories surrounding the, the travel truck stop um, is whether or not she was she became a victim of trafficking. So, mm -hmm. you know, if her phone was in the car, you know, he didn't look for it yet. He's just trying to move her first um that's definitely a part of the consideration yeah and you know she, uh, apparently based on what's going on in this family she would have been extremely well groomed to be handed off to a trafficking situation so yeah yeah definitely a lot of concern there and it's also a bay i mean there's also i mean it's right out to the wi open wide open ocean there um yeah yeah, yeah. I, I would bet that there's there's some form of trafficking that's happening in this area even as it is but mm -hmm. Um, all right. So if we didn't have enough indicators that something has gone terribly wrong, uh, what happens that following day on June 1st? This is the day that Donnie's scheduled a time with investigator Winberg to talk about the allegations. But instead, the investigator got a call from Wendy Holland, Donnie's wife, saying that Donnie is acting erratically. She said he is contemplating ending his life and that she is driving around looking for him, but can't find him. Sheriff's office issues a bolo or be on the lookout alert for Donnie. At approximately 30 minutes before Donnie is scheduled to meet with Winberg, 
Donnie drives to a vacant lot near his home. After arriving, Donnie sustains what officials later determined to be a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head in an attempt to take his own life, but he does it using a gun registered to Brittany. It's crazy. Now, I want to kind of keep in mind that we've been talking about Brittany and about her being missing, but at this in this time frame, they don't know that yet. No one knows that she's missing. So it just all of a sudden, they don't even know that she went off with her uncle. So mm-hmm. all of a sudden, her uncle is just acting flippy, saying he's going to harm himself. Uh, and the uncle's wife is trying to get help, trying to track him down. And then he does, and it winds up being with Brittany's gun. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He, he has an item belonging to someone that we know will become a missing person hours after he was last known to be with her. Like, this is really, really, really terrible. Um, how do they mm-hmm. find him? How do they eventually catch up and find him? Baldwin County 911 received a call from an unknown female. The caller reported that Donnie was sitting in a black suburban with a gunshot wound to the head and they don't want to touch him, but he is still breathing on his own. So Donnie's wife is one of the people that found him. She told dispatchers that she received a call from him earlier and dispatch requested EMS, Life Flight, and the Baldwin County Sheriff's Office, or BCSO. The dispatch notes reflect that the location was possibly River Road instead of River Park Road. And the locations are important to note because the end of River Park Road is approximately 0.2 miles from Donnie and Wendy's home. So it's literally right there. But the end of River Road is approximately a mile away from their home. Are we sure which one of those actually was the location he was at? Because I'm all, I'm kind of grabbed by this thought that, you know, she doesn't know where he is. He's called her. He says he's going to harm himself. She's mm-hmm. calling police, but then she's the one to roll up and find him. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, if it was the first option, if it was River Park Road, and that's only 0.2 miles from their home and she's out driving, you know, maybe there's a possibility she would see his vehicle there one mile from the home. You know, it gets a little bit trickier because you got a lot of different directions you can go in. That that circle gets a lot bigger at one mile. Um, but do we know for sure, Dana, do you know if if we know which of those locations he was actually found at? Um, I don't recall, to be honest, um, okay. but I know it was very close to the home. So, I mean, it, we can double check that in okay. the timeline, but so yeah. it seems, it I, seems I think, feasible yeah. that she did actually, she did find him. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. And well, I think to that too, there's, you know, there's a lot of concern about, um, if he was closer, I mean, it messes up the timeline that she gives to dispatchers too. Oh, okay. Right. Gotcha. Gotcha. So, yeah. So, uh, seems like something weird happens when she does find him. What happens, Dana? According to statements made in the Monsters in the Shadows docuseries, instead of initially calling 911, Wendy may have deleted at least four text messages from Donnie's phone. This is confirmed by the investigator, who states in the series that law enforcement is aware Wendy manipulated the scene and deleted messages from Donnie's phone. He does not believe that the messages were ever recovered. Okay, so obviously... I'm wondering what was so important in those messages that she would, I mean, this guy, he's still alive when she's Mm -hmm. dealing with this Mm -hmm. and she's grabbing his phone and deleting messages like that. I'm thinking there's an admission in there. There's an admission of guilt, or there's at least enough conversation around. I shouldn't have done what I did. Like something really, really bad there. Um, And it's also interesting to me that there was no way to recover those messages because even I guess it depends on what service those messages were sent through. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, True. yeah, I don't know. I don't know what she could have been. It's just it's very bizarre behavior. Like, that's why I'm just looking at this whole piece in terms of Wendy's involvement. And I'm like, what is going on around this? Mm-hmm. Like, oh, yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, that's part of where I, I definitely question the location. I mean, I'm, obviously, this is a total guess on my part. But I would think that if it were closer to home, like the the uh, river park road for only Mm -hmm. 0.2 miles you know if she's calling the detective trying to buy herself time saying oh he's you know he left i'm trying i'm looking for him but maybe she already found him Mm -hmm. and then obviously needing the time to 
get the phone out, delete the messages. Obviously, she would when she would come upon him, if he had already shot himself, she'd probably be in shock for a second of like, oh, my God. And then to have the the thought and the energy of, oh, I'm going to find his cell phone and delete messages. I mean, it has to be something so serious to Mm -hmm. literally and metaphorically get your hands dirty to do that. Yeah. She's reaching around her dying husband at this point. Like, yeah. But I mean, also, she doesn't remove like my I feel like your instinct should be to make sure he's breathing you know you know maybe if you needed to do cpr they're like i don't want to touch him like it's very odd response i think from a a, a wife to to literally say i don't want to touch him yeah. um so that's always like caught me off guard mm-hmm. uh in that you know your first instinct is not to touch him or save him but to delete messages it's just <laughs> yeah. it doesn't make any sense to me yeah and i wonder too like who were the messages sent to? If it's messages that he had sent to Wendy, she would have her own phone. So she could also, you know, maybe she has to delete them on her end too. Mm-hmm. Um, or are they messages to Brittany's phone? And she's already knowing like that maybe they took care of Brittany's phone or are about to. So getting rid of this side of the the text chain um, would cover both ends. So, I mean, yeah. you know, ultimately just the act of deleting messages is mm-hmm. just completely strange. Especially in this situation like this. Yeah. yeah. And, and keeping in mind as of right at, at this point, no one knows that Brittany's missing. Yeah. So it's like, I think Wendy clearly has some knowledge of something that's happened in this situation. Mm. Uh, it's just her actions are speaking to, she has some level of knowledge of, of what's going on around this. Um, mm. It and might be that he Chessie- told her. It might be that mm. he, he told yeah. her, you know, when when he got mm-hmm. on the phone call with her. I don't know, but she clearly knows something. Yeah. And um, I, that's why Chessie says that she believes that Wendy knows because yeah. this all adds up to Wendy knowing. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, what did the first responders find at the scene when they finally get there? When BCSO deputies arrived, a female directed them towards Donnie Suburban, where they observed another female standing in the driver's doorway of the vehicle with the door open and a male laying back in the driver's seat. They identified the male as Donnie and the females as Wendy and family friend Jennifer. The records note a red Chevy Aveo was parked directly beside the Suburban, almost window to window, facing the same direction. Such a strange note. And yeah. of course, to see here too that. So if someone was standing in the driver's doorway of the vehicle, but the car was parked window to window, I would think the red car is actually driven around the other side on the passenger side, maybe. Um, I don't know. But that, I mean, that detail is super strange of getting window to window, but also not wanting to touch and help the person, which is so weird. Mm-hmm. Um So, but the first responders know that Donnie had an obvious gunshot wound to the right side of his head behind the ear, and he was still moving when law enforcement arrived. He was airlifted to a hospital in Pensacola, Florida, and then a Raven handgun was located by Donnie's feet between the seat and the center console, which was removed and secured in a law enforcement vehicle. Once investigator Eric Winberg and the criminal investigations division arrived, The scene was turned over to them for further processing. Eric inspected the Raven handgun found in the SUV and noted blood spatter on the muzzle and the slide and a blood smear on the grip next to the serial number. Eric had Donnie's SUV transported from the scene to the sheriff's office in Robertsdale and submitted the items collected to the evidence locker. Multiple members of the Holland and Wood families are with Donnie at the hospital. Although Donnie is unconscious, Sonia, Brittany's aunt, recalled Wendy repeatedly asking Donnie, where's Brittany? After receiving the news about Holland, family members began calling Brittany to let her know what had transpired. When those attempts were unsuccessful, the family called the friend Brittany had mentioned she was going to see. The friend confirmed that Brittany had not visited that day. She had instead gone with Holland. On June 2nd, 2012, after being unable to reach Brittany on the phone or through friends, a missing persons report was filed with the Mobile Police Department. A few days later, on June 4th of 2012, at 3.30 p.m., Donnie was taken off of life support. 
Eric Winberg was notified by hospital officials that Donnie was declared deceased and an autopsy would be performed on June 6th. So then on June 6th and June 7th of 2012, members of the Baldwin County Sheriff's Office searched the area around the home that Donnie had been living in. And the Sheriff's Office reports finding no evidence in the search, which ultimately leads them to believe that Brittany was not in Baldwin County. I've heard that before in certain missing persons cases where it's like, oh, well, we searched this one place. They're definitely not here. Like, honestly, even in the Brandon Lawson case, there was a local deputy that was like, no, 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 we've searched. He's not here. He's gone. He went over to Mexico. He did this. He did that. And then years and years later, you know, remains are found. Like, it's just it's, I don't know why that perspective happens that way, because when you do talk to professional search teams, they'll tell you like, yeah, we looked, but you can only be like 70 percent sure. Like even if they if they hit a boots on ground search, you know, um, so yeah, I'm mm. always amazed when I see that perspective. No, no, she's she's probably not here. Mm. She probably is, but yeah. yeah. So after searching the Sticks River area for any signs of Brittany with no luck, a frustrated Stephanie Hankey tells the media, "Quote: We're hunting for our daughter, and we don't know where to turn." The family says that part of the frustration with searching is that they don't know what they are doing and they need help. Soon after this, the segment is aired, Class Kids offers their assistance. And there are many searches conducted with several focusing on the Sticks River Basin, an area where Brittany's phone pinged on the night that she disappeared. While the searches find some potential evidence, it doesn't really pan out until something shows up in an unexpected place. Chessie says that approximately two weeks after Fairhope Police Department finished processing Donnie's SUV, Wendy showed up at Chessie's home with Brittany's cell phone battery. Wendy allegedly said that she found it in Donnie's SUV when it was released back to her. Chessie knew it was Brittany's because of the markings that were etched in it by Brittany's stepfather, when in an effort to help Brittany fix her phone, he removed the battery. Chessie called the Fairhope Police Department and asked if they were aware of the battery. They said they were, but that the battery is not considered significant because it does not hold data. Brittany's phone has never been found. It, you know, it might not be super significant, except how often have either of you touched your cell phone's battery? Have you ever? I had my brother help fix my phone once in high school, and then that was it. Yeah. Like, and especially nowadays, <laughs> like you, you just, it, they're so hard to get to nowadays. Now I, I know we're rolling the clock back a little bit, but, um, it's interesting to me because maybe forensically there might've been like, did they find mm -hmm. Donnie's thumbprint on the battery? Like that could actually tell a piece of the story. And outside of that, this is from an item. Cell phones are pretty personal to us. Um, so we do have, if nothing else, we've got an item of hers found in a suspicious manner because the battery has been removed from the device that it's supposed to be in, in a s potential suspect's vehicle, person that ended his own life around her disappearance. Like it's, it's very bizarre to me that that wasn't retained and, and at least checked forensically, at least just to close that gap of like, oh, well, for some reason, we did find his fingerprints. Why would Donnie have touched her battery? Yeah. Why does and he have her gun? Into, right. And taken into the context of some other cases, I know that we know the law enforcement hold on to phones almost indefinitely. There are some cases we've we've seen where families don't even get the phones back ever. Yeah. And so, you know, that's a big part of it. But I mean, you mentioned the gun. So a month later in July, law enforcement confirms that the Raven 25 caliber handgun does belong to Brittany. And so this announcement fuels rumors that Brittany may have shot Donnie and skipped town. Uh, however, but Chessie tells local media that as a family, they couldn't see how Brittany would have had the means to actually do that. Mm. And according to Brittany's relatives, Brittany normally carried two bullets in her gun. And officials confirmed that the weapon only had one bullet left after Donnie shot himself. So that month, Brittany's father also says he wants her case upgraded to a criminal investigation. And despite Brittany's mother also stating that she suspects foul play in Brittany's disappearance, Mobile Police spokesman Chris Levy states, all indications are is that she is out there somewhere, just not coming forward. Uh, I, I just, 
yeah, I'm so shocked time and time again. No, she's out there. She's out there. All right. Mm -hmm. It's, it's possible. Absolutely. It's possible, but, um, it, I wouldn't state all indications are in a case like this, because mm -hmm. you've had a yeah. lot of bizarre things happening around this disappearance and things that are suggesting there was some type of escalation and we're dealing with a very, and we know that this is a high drama situation. Like we know because of the other charges happening around this family, there is something very, very bad happening around all this. So I don't know. And I know it's just a spokesman, you know, for the police department, but saying all indications, I just, I wouldn't quite do that. One other thing um, you did touch on though, that I think is important. She was known to carry two bullets in the gun one is still in there and we know one was used for donnie so it's it was just con i was thinking about the possibility that that might have been used as a weapon against britney as well mm -hmm. um but we know based on what her family's saying and knowing that there was one still in there that it seems like that isn't the case and i just i don't know we have law enforcement believing britney's on the run even though she's last seen with a guy that's under investigation and harmed himself ended his own life before she was even known to be missing mm -hmm. absolutely so in april of 2013 fox 10 aired a special report featuring interviews with family members and investigators including eric winberg and winberg refers to Brittany as he calls it the golden nugget in a sex abuse investigation he says that this is essentially someone who could tell the entire story mm -hmm. On September 25th, 2013, friends and family gathered to celebrate Brittany's 21st birthday, and they had high hopes of some new details coming to light. The criminal trials for family members accused of being part of this trafficking ring were starting, and those trials included Wendy Holland. Two of the 11 suspects confessed to seeing numerous child pornography videos that include an unnamed victim as well as Brittany at various ages. After this, authorities execute a search warrant on Wendy's home and seize information from a computer tower and a cell phone. It would be the first of several searches at the home. 11 family members and friends were charged and convicted in the criminal trials, including Wendy Holland, who was sentenced to 219 years. In a statement to Press Register and AL.com, a sheriff's office spokesperson, Lori Miles, stated, they all have something to do with Brittany Wood. Maybe not her disappearance, but they're all connected. Chessie also spoke up to the media, and in an interview with Daily Mail, Chessie stated, quote, I know who can tell me what happened to Brittany. It's my sister, Wendy. She knows what took place, and I just beg her to tell the truth. No more hiding and no more lies. In 2014, Sheriff Huey Max stated that Brittany had not come across any other department's radar and that the evidence indicated that she is likely deceased. And in 2018, a local NBC News affiliate spoke to Brittany's then eight-year-old daughter on what would have been her mom's 26th birthday. Peyton said, I would give her a balloon. I can't give her a hug. I wish I could. I miss her. Well... I'm glad that law enforcement seems to be getting their head around the fact that she's just not out there somewhere waiting to come home. But in the 10 years since Brittany went missing, there have been multiple tips and searches with little results. While the focus of the investigation into Brittany's case should remain squarely on her disappearance and eventual recovery, it's impossible to fully separate the sexual abuse aspect of this case. Most of Britney's family feel like the criminal investigation and subsequent arrests overshadowed Britney's disappearance and took priority over finding her. And they also agree that it's hard to deny any connection between the two investigations, which was another thing that just kept shocking me through today's case. Like, mm -hmm. how are we? They're separate. They're separate. They're separate. Really? Why? Yeah. Because Donnie didn't face charges ultimately? I mean, really, that's what happens, right? Like, he ends his life, so he's not part of that anymore. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't mean that those two things weren't connected. But mm -hmm. we have a quote here. Uh, it's more than just a missing person. Something's went wrong somewhere, and I think they just need to take it more serious. And that was said by Brittany's father, Wally Hankey. Her stepmother, Stephanie Hankey, said, I want to make sure Brittany's name will always be known. If nothing else, I don't want anyone to forget the name Brittany Wood. 
Today, Brittany's case remains open and is being managed by the Mobile Police Department. Authorities strongly suspect that she's no longer alive. However, she is still officially listed as a missing person in the databases. To date, neither she, her phone, or any items that she left the house with that day have ever been found. Investigators continue to follow up on tips and information as they're received. While law enforcement has maintained the investigation into Brittany's disappearance is not related to the criminal investigation, they are at least getting their head around the fact they could be indirectly linked. I think it's more than indirect personally, but I don't know. I, you know, I don't have the proof. So, uh, her mother, her mother made a comment to the press saying, there's no handbook for this. You keep their memory alive. You let them live on through you. Brittany is Caucasian, stands at five foot one inch tall and weighs 105 pounds with a thin build. She was last seen wearing a blue tank top, blue denim shorts and flip flops. She was carrying a pink or teal tote bag containing extra clothing, a red curling iron, a makeup bag and a cell phone. She has dirty blonde or brown hair and blue eyes with a lip piercing and a tattoo on her left leg that says Peyton. There is a reward for information leading to Brittany. Anyone with that information can call the Mobile Police Department at 251-208-7211. If you need to remain anonymous for any reason, please contact Crime Stoppers at 251-208-7000. And a big thank you to all of the sources that helped on this case. There are literally too many to list here, but you can find them at the profile over on Uncovered.com. Special shout outs to Fox10NAL.com for their ongoing coverage. Of course, the Monsters in the Shadows documentary and Stephanie Hankey for her work with Dana and the Uncovered community to get all of these details and this timeline really solid and put together. And if you're looking for a space to meet like-minded true crime enthusiasts and advocates while also engaging in case discussions, look no further than that same Uncovered community. We even have a space in the community completely dedicated to this series with John Lorden, where we discuss the cases we've covered in each episode. Regardless of whether you join our community or not, you still have access to the Uncovered database, where you can see all of our sources and a full timeline of Brittany's case. If you want to support the work we do, check out Uncovered's merch. You can find links in the description box below. We hope that you've enjoyed this series with Uncovered, and I want to thank Andrea, Dana, Rachel, Jim Brown, and everyone else at Uncovered.com for taking this journey with me. This has been Lord and Arts Uncovered.